Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of the CRE Exchange. I'm Cole Perry, your host and senior market analyst at Altus Group, a leading provider of asset and fund level intelligence. I'm joined by Omar El our U.S. Director of Research. Together, we'll share the latest news and trends in the U.S. commercial real estate market. Omar, it's great to be with you. Glad to be here. We're recording here on Monday, November 27th, but what caught your attention in the last few weeks? Yeah, so it was a short week with the Thanksgiving holiday, but on Monday, November 20th, the conference board released its U.S. leading economic index for October. And this is an index of macro and market leading measures to really provide an early indication of pivots in the business cycle and the overall economic well-being. The index for October fell 80 basis points to a level of 103.9. This is the lowest level since May of 2020. The October release marked the 19th consecutive monthly drop in the index. And over the past six months, this index has contracted by 3%. And while the downward trajectory is a negative signal, there is a bit of a silver lining, which is that the recent pace of contraction is slowing slightly compared to the six months that came before. And in the press release uh, that accompanied the October numbers, the conference board noted that deteriorating consumers' expectations for business conditions, along with falling equities and tighter credit conditions, were some of the key drivers in the recent index dip. Also, what caught my attention was the release of the FOMC minutes. These were released on Tuesday, the 21st of November, really covering the meeting from earlier in the month that was followed by a press conference on the 1st of November, recapping what was discussed in the decision from the Federal Open Market Committee, or FOMC. And these minutes, I would say, didn't necessarily bring anything new, but they really did reiterate a number of the points that were made during the press conference after the Fed's decision. What I would note is the elements that were being reiterated really included that members of the FOMC agreed that more time with rates and a monetary policy in a restrictive territory was needed to cool inflation, though additional hikes may not be needed. Um, but I, I would caveat that with a, they didn't say that rate hikes uh, or additional rate hikes were off the table. They're trying to be data dependent and relying on the information as it comes in. But the market has really priced in a 3% chance of an additional hike at the December 13th meeting. This is down from 20% probability that the markets were pricing in one month ago. And while additional rate hikes are largely, I would say, not expected. It doesn't mean that cuts are really in the near term. And the FOMC minutes really reiterated this as well. So with remaining in restrictive territory, no new hikes expected. The market is pricing in the first rate cuts to really come in the the back half of the first half of 2024, or I would say late in the first half of 2024. And another thing I would note, and the final note I would have on the FOMC minutes is that the Fed really did underline the fact that they are not trying to be prescriptive with their policy going forward. They don't want to prematurely signal to the market that they're reversing their policy stance, and they continue to emphasize that they are targeting the 2% inflation for the economy. So until they see that, I would say we're in this higher for longer, right? And then finally, on the macro front, what I would highlight is that on Monday of last week, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York released the Survey of Consumer Expectations Credit Access Survey. This is released every four months. So this triannual survey captures consumers' experiences and expectations regarding demand for and access to credit. And the most recent results were generally not positive compared to the results from 2022. The reason why they weren't positive is because they were reflecting declining demand for credit, 
as well as higher rejection rates for consumer credit applications and overall souring consumer expectations for both credit demand and credit application and approval over the next 12 months. And so if you take these together and couple it with the fact that the survey results were also showing a slight but notable rise in subjective financial fragility across U.S. households, the overall release was a negative. And so diving into those results just a little bit more, I would say while overall demand for consumer credit was down across all the consumer credit categories on a year-on-year basis, it was generally up from the prior two surveys released earlier this year. And that was driven in a large part by credit card applications and credit card limit increases that were reported in the survey. Demand for mortgages and mortgage refinances really continued to fall, as one would expect in a higher rate environment. And also rejection rates on credit applications rose overall, but declined for applications for credit card limit increases and for new mortgage applications. So looking specifically at the mortgage application and rejection data associated with the mortgage applications, they really helped to paint this kind of unique picture that we're, we've been living through in terms of the housing market, because it reflects that a smaller cohort of higher credit worthy consumers are still active in the mortgage market and haven't been priced out quite yet. Like many others, they may have fewer means or are overall perceived as less credit worthy. And then the final comments I would make on this survey data is that Looking forward and and looking at the expectations portion of the survey results and specifically at the data of consumer expectations for the next 12 months, households expect that they will be less likely to apply credit in terms of credit cards, auto loans, or mortgages for either purchase or refinancing than a year ago. The survey data also showed significant upticks from 2022 data in terms of expectations for their credit applications getting rejected. So consumers are viewing it as they're, they're going to apply for less and they're expecting a higher probability of getting rejected. And one thing I would call out here is the expectations for likelihood of a mortgage application in the next 12 months getting rejected jumped from 34.7% in October of 2022 to 47.6% in October 2023. So that means nearly half of those who expect to apply for mortgage credit are ultimately viewing it as a, almost a coin flip in terms of getting rejected. And then I guess the final note is that the percentage of involuntary account closures reported jumped to 8 0.5% up from 5.7% a year ago. So involuntary account closures is usually a sign of deteriorating credit conditions. And I know this is a lot of focus on the consumer, but I, I would bring it back to how does this relate to commercial real estate? You got to first put it in the context of the economy as a whole. The consumer really accounts for 65, 70% of overall GDP and overall economic activity. If you want to bring it directly to commercial real estate, look at the sectors that have been really thriving recently, whether that is the rally in retail as consumers continue to spend, whether that's on things, goods, services, but also on travel. You see the hospitality sector has performed quite well with ADRs and in many markets reaching new peaks, as well as if credit conditions and consumer credit conditions and household financial fragility increase and you start seeing deteriorating credit conditions, you can expect pretty much all aspects of commercial real estate to be affected, not only on where they're consuming, but that's where you start getting into the more concerning areas, which would be in terms of housing, right? So you could see increased delinquencies, which we are starting to see those come through. But I would do a quick reminder of a deterioration in conditions. It, it's concerning, but it's not necessarily a red flag. The end is not nigh. But I know that a huge part of consumer credit and commercial real estate is the housing sector. And 
Cole, I know I want to bring you back into this because I've been chatting a little long here, but I know you've been looking at a, a lot of the housing data. What have you seen recently? Since we spoke last on the podcast a few weeks ago, we got a few big releases on housing. And just to remind people, we get data on building permits, on housing starts, and then sales. So housing is permitted, and then it's constructed, then it's sold. So these all kind of feed into one another. On November 17th, we got data on building permits. Single family permits rose 0.5% month on month in October. Multifamily was up 2.2% in October. Permits are actually at their highest level for single family in 18 months. Now, we talk a little bit about deteriorating credit conditions, high mortgage rates, and I think these are finally coming to fruition as far as single family housing is concerned with all these folks locked in lower rate mortgages in existing homes, which historically make up a massive percentage of home sales. We're now seeing this slim pipeline or this slim supply kind of draw people back into the home building market. So permits are up and they're actually now exceeding pre-pandemic permitting levels. That's for the first time in in three or four years. Housing starts rose 0.2% in October. That's for single family. And for multifamily, it was actually up 4.9%. So a huge jump. This tight single family supply is now supporting new construction. Home builder confidence is still very low. It's at a 11 month low. And interestingly, if you break out housing starts by region, you'll see that they were flat for the Northeast and the Midwest and down in the South, but way up out West. And I think that's largely because the Western markets are super supply constrained when it comes to certain types of housing. And so they've finally started to build some of this permitted housing we saw show up in that data a few months ago. As far as sales are concerned, we actually got this data at 9 a.m. today, November 27th. So housing sales for new homes fell 5.6% in October from 679,000 from a revised 719,000 in September as mortgage rates remain elevated. So Freddie Mac estimated that the rate actually dropped for a 30-year fixed mortgage rate from 7.8% a a few weeks back down to 7.3% last week, so right around Thanksgiving. So the sale of new homes is actually up 17.7% from a year ago, and largely because the existing home market remains frozen and a lot of this new supply is coming online. So some interesting stuff there, but I was also taking a look at retail, and so This is one of those big indicators of where the consumer is sitting. We talk about consumer confidence, what the conference board is saying, but I was taking a look at a few things. One we saw in earnings reports. So I've mentioned this a few times on the podcast, but retailers are the first of earnings, depending on how you look at the season, because they want to capture the holiday season. So they're about a month delayed from, say, the banks. So there were quite a few of these since we spoke last. We'll start with the big ones. So Target and Walmart. Analyst expectations for Target were extremely low. So they have cited recently retail theft. Folks call it shrink. And they Target is increasingly cautious or is citing increasingly cautious consumers. Amongst other things, the student loan repayment resumption in October But despite revenue slipping a bit, they still beat on earnings expectations and on revenue. They saw a jump in profit and their stock actually surged 17% shortly after their release. Target is nonetheless a little bit concerned about inflation pressuring their core consumer base. They're already seeing declining demand for apparel and electronics, which are big ticket items at Target. But Walmart was also a beat. Their shares did slide after, though, because they offered quite a cautious outlook on the economy. Consumer spending slipped in October, and Walmart said that dwindling household savings are making their kind of sales uneven. What is Walmart's saving grace that makes them a little bit different than Target? They are one of the largest grocery sellers in the United States. In fact, I think a plurality of grocery dollars in the United States are spent at Walmart. It's interesting here, the commentary, so it's a little difficult to follow, but Their CEO stated there's been some disinflation on goods like chicken and dairy products, which is drawing people back to their grocery business. So even if you need more sales to make that back up since prices are falling, people are still shopping at Walmart and buying additional goods 
while they're there doing grocery shopping. So this has been a huge boon for them, and they expect that to actually show up in their next quarter. So they've revised their expectations for the end of the year. I think it'll be quite interesting to see how these two retailers, Target and Walmart, compare when we hear their earnings in a few months. But really interesting stuff there. I also wanted to draw our attention to Macy's. So Macy's posted a surprise profit. Their costs were quite down and margins were a bit up. So their shares jumped 6% after their earnings release. Uh, Their inventories are flat over the same quarter a year ago. And they're saying that they have flexibility to buy more or less of what goods people are actually looking for from department stores. And so while they struggle to find their footing in the post-department store era, which we've covered quite a bit, either on this podcast or in some of our recent research articles, Macy's is still pretty optimistic about the holiday season. This was a cool little nugget from their earnings call. So one of the reasons they're pretty optimistic is that since American Thanksgiving fell on the 23rd and Christmas falls on a Monday, consumers actually get an extra week to shop before Christmas. And so this might be a big boon for a lot of the retailers we're taking a look at and particularly of interest to some of the uh, institutional owners of retail real estate. This might be an interesting year for them if the holiday brings any particular large change in sales. I also took a look at TJX. So that's the owner of TJ Maxx, Marshalls, and Home Goods. So they continue to gain customers as inflation and it largely scares people away from retailers like Macy's or Target. So their same store sales were up 7% at TJ Maxx and Marshalls, which they lumped together in this stat. And that was above 4% expected from analysts. They were up 9% for home goods and analysts expected it to be about 6%. So the interesting nugget here was that foot traffic was actually up quite a bit at TJX stores over the same period a year ago. And they are expecting a huge 2023 holiday season but they believe that they're successful in spite of some other trends in retail. They think that they're unlike traditional retailers because shopping at a TJX store is is akin to treasure hunting. You wouldn't consider it to be an experiential retail use, which has really driven a lot of leasing in recent years in retail, but a discount retailer can be an experience in and of itself. Not necessarily an ad for them, but I thought that was quite interesting. And I've never heard that commentary made before, even though I've heard some stuff from other folks that like to shop at those places. But the last retailers I'll call out here are Home Depot and Lowe's. If you listen to both of these earnings calls in quick succession, I don't know if you'd be able to tell which one you were listening to. So sales declined at both of them. They are struggling to sell goods purchased with credit. I think that echoes some of the stuff you talked about a few minutes ago, uh, namely large appliances, large fixtures that people don't usually pay with cash. Consumers are still pulling back on their home improvement projects, and you're seeing home remodeling projects dip. So people are holding off on those, and that's showing up in their direct sales to contractors, so larger orders. Nonetheless, both of them beat earnings expectations. They have seen some comparable same store declines since the pandemic, but they're both still operating on quite elevated levels from where they were, say, five years ago. So really interesting stuff there. And I think all the stores we mentioned, particularly Target, Walmart, Macy's, Home Depot, Lowe's, Really interesting businesses because they also have huge industrial holdings as well. So whether they own those spaces or they lease them, they have huge supply chains. So these I pay attention to not just for direct retail exposure because a lot of them own their own locations, but they're big indicators of where the industrial market is looking to. Walmart had an interesting tidbit in their earnings call that that they're strengthening last mile delivery, which they've historically not played a huge part in because they can store so much stuff at their local stores. So they're looking to expand their warehouses where a lot of other big retailers are not. So quite interesting stuff there in earnings calls. Look forward to seeing what they'll say next quarter, following up on what'll be a really interesting holiday season with some of these rather difficult credit conditions. I also wanted to mention we got advanced retail sales between the last episode and this one, and they fell less than expected in October from September. So they were down 0.1%. This was the first decline since March, and the figure was expected to be as much as a 0.3% month-on-month decline. 
but food actually surged quite a bit, 0.6%. Vehicles declined 1%. Non-store sales, think Amazon or direct-to-consumer businesses, they rose 0.2%. General retail trade, though, so that's virtually everything else at big box stores, down 0.2% from September, but still up 1.6% from a year ago. So a lot of numbers there, but quite an interesting breakdown for advanced retail sales. Again, I want to see how this shakes out after the holidays. The bow to, to tie on this is we just had Black Friday, and today is Cyber Monday, so 1127. American shoppers have, uh, you, and you'll probably read this headline or have read this headline many times by the time you hear the podcast, but folks are saying that Black Friday isn't what it used to be. I don't know if that's a normative statement about the fact that it should be different or something, but consumers are feeling that they're not getting as good of deals as they used to. A lot of folks are preferring to shop online on Cyber Monday. But I think what's really happening here, and I've certainly noticed this anecdotally, is that Black Friday doesn't seem to be a day, but more of a, a season. So deals stretch from before Thanksgiving all the way out to the end of this week. And so I think retail has really shifted with the consumer to uh, adapt here. But a lot of interesting stuff. Omar, I don't know if you did any Black Friday or Cyber Monday shopping, but quite interesting stuff. I did. And I also remember Black Friday when you had to wake up early, right? One actually fell on Friday and stayed on Friday and you had to wake up early to go. And that was something that I remember I had to beg my mom to take me and she did not really want to do it, but it was an experience. It was a slice of Americana to be up at earlier than you want to, standing with strangers to compete over things that you may or may not get. So maybe that's why the discounts aren't there. It's because we're not sweating for those deals. Maybe that's right. We'll have to see. I know you were also taking a look this week at the capital markets. What can you tell us about that? Yes. I would say while the macro news was pretty mixed, the market's generally reacted positively over the last two weeks. Yield on the 10-year treasury continued to slide, and it's really fallen nearly 60 basis points from touching 5% in October, and it's now settled down around 4.4%. And while lower benchmark yields are attractive for many in the market, I would flag that the short end of the curve is still near 5%. And so the fall in the longer end of the curve essentially continues to keep the yield curve inverted. Whether you're looking at the 10 versus Fed funds versus three month versus the two year pairs. I know I've brought this up on a number of previous episodes, but that is still very much a concerning sign, right? Inverted yield curve is not a good sign. Hopping over to equity markets, I would say broad indices rallied on the close of generally positive third quarter earnings. You touched on many of those. And with third quarter earnings pretty much uh, wrapped up, near more than 60% of companies reported beats in terms of revenue expectations, nearly 80% reported uh, EPS beats, and that's according to FactSet. However, much of the equity ebullience, I haven't actually said that word out loud before, so I'm hope hopefully saying that the right way, but the equity excitement, I would say, is really concentrated in large cap tech companies, which have dominated broad market indices. To put it into context, the NASDAQ composite index it has been up 13% over the last month. And then if you narrow down on the top 100 or the NASDAQ 100 index, so that's the 100 largest in the NASDAQ composite, that is up 45% year to date. And the NASDAQ 100 is back at levels really not seen since the first few weeks in the, the very start of 2022 and currently sits just about three percentage points shy of the all-time highs that were set in the fourth quarter of 2021. So a handful of companies have really skewed those broad market indices. And while the markets are weighing the impact of either stable or potentially lower rate environment that they expect to see in the next 12 months, as well as they're weighing that against the prospects of the productivity gains. And I would say a lot of the hopes for efficiency and efficiency gains that many seem to think AI uh, will bring in the near term. They have to put those positive points against a 
slowing consumer uh, with deteriorating kind of credit conditions, as well as still many mixed signals, such as the inverted yield curve we just touched on. And I would say, as we're closing out 2023, the markets really seem to be a bit tenuous, right? One of the measures I like looking at is stock and bond cross-asset correlations and the 60-day rolling average correlation across U.S. stocks and U.S. bonds has increased. So usually when correlations are converging and moving together, that's not a good sign, right? So if it's usually during crises when correlations all go to one. So watching those correlations really rise is not a positive. And what I'm looking forward to, because it is that time of the year, reading the outlooks that money managers and banks and analysts are going to be putting out over the next few weeks for what they expect to see in 2024. Some are going to try to dodge it, stay pretty vague, whereas others, I could see views starting really to diverge, right? So if you recall, coming into this year, it seemed like everybody was anticipating that recession that really never came. I think that we're going to start seeing a little bit more divergence here in in those outlooks. And while many of these capital market outlooks are going to be focused on macro level, as well as, I would say, multi-asset calls across various asset markets, we did get a bit of a glance into CRE-specific expectations because we did complete the second iteration of our CRE industry conditions and sentiment survey. So we ran this survey between mid-October and early November, and this is a Altus Research Team initiative that is seeking to capture the perspective of CRE practitioners, really their individual perspectives on what they're seeing currently in the market, as well as what their expectations are for what's to come. And the survey really explores a lot, right? It covers topics from what their firms are currently focused on to what they think they're going to be focused on and keep priorities over the coming months, but as well as detailed financing terms of either what they're offering to investors or or to borrowers, or also what they're seeing in the market and how they're expecting the operating environment to change. We're going to be releasing the report in early December, actually on the December 6th, and we're going to be discussing the survey results in more detail on a special episode that you should see coming out right around the release of the report. We did want to give a quick sneak peek today. So the survey responses collected were really from nearly 500 professionals that represented more than 100 unique firms across both the U.S. and Canada. And while the survey was open to CRE professionals of all experience levels, the average years of experience reported across the U.S. respondents was 17 years and 21 years in Canada. So many CRE veterans offered their opinions. So first, let's take a quick sneak peek at the U.S. results. A few of the top takeaways that caught our attention included, one, that a significant majority of respondents, nearly 77%, indicated that they expect a recession in the next six months. And breaking that 77% down, 22% said that they expect that recession in the next six months is very likely, while the remaining 55% said that it was somewhat likely. So a little bit mixed there. Additionally, we asked what the shape of the next recession might look like. And while a majority or 80% of the respondents expected the next recession to be shallow, the expectation around the duration of the recession was largely split. So of that 80%, 37% are expecting a shallow and short-lived recession, whereas the remaining 43% expect it to be shallow and long-lived. Another key takeaway from the U.S. is that transactions are expected to go up, right? So this is a positive. Transactions in the U.S. were down around 55% through the first three quarters of 2023 compared to the same period or the first three quarters of 2022. But despite this difficult year of really muted transaction activity. The recent survey data shows that respondents have indicated that they expect market activity to pick up. So speaking about their own firm intent, 79% of the survey participants noted plans of transacting over the next six months. 
So these intentions were really significantly split by firm size. And that was a pretty interesting observation. And so what we saw is that the larger institutions are those who have more than 5 billion AUM dedicated to, to commercial real estate, plan on being net sellers over the next six months. Meanwhile, smaller firms, so those with less than 5 billion AUM, plan to be net buyers. So similar to the US, across investment strategies in Canada, a consensus has emerged on near-term recession expectations. So a significant majority or 78% of respondents expect a recession to be likely really in the next six months. And again, most of these participants expect the recession to be shallow. And also for Canada, expectations for net levered IRRs or the returns that an investor would expect to receive reported across strategies differed, but really reflected the different risk profiles targeted by the different strategies. And net levered IRRs really ranged from 11% for core strategies up to 15.7% for opportunistic strategies. And so this reflects the, I would say, the optimism that there are still deals to be done and pretty attractive returns for investors. Now, Cole, I know that you dove into some of the data that we asked specifically around artificial intelligence. What did you find there? Yeah, so this is the first time we asked this question. Uh, It was not on the quarter three survey, but it was on this one. It's been about a year since the release of a few of these large language models. And so we've taken the time to process how this might be utilized in commercial real estate. More than 72% of US respondents actually reported that AI has practical applications and will benefit CRE professionals and the industry. But that was not shared completely across those with certain industry experience. So nearly 80% of respondents with fewer than 15 years of experience viewed it this way. But only 60% of respondents with more than 20 years of experience held that same view. Now, there's a bit of AI skepticism among some. And so this was marked by the choice, AI is unproven technology and its impact is uncertain. So that was shared amongst 37% of all respondents, but the highest was amongst novice professionals. So 50% for folks with less than five years of experience and the veterans with more than 20 years of experience. Overall responses show that about one in five view AI as a threat, but this was highest actually amongst seasoned professionals. So with 11 to 20 years of experience, it's about 40%. So the kind of big takeaways here for me, wide swaths of respondents believe that AI has practical implications, but only certain sectors view this as a threat. Portfolio management is seen as a ripe functional area for AI, I think for some relatively obvious reasons. It has more positive views of the technology than most other sectors. Lastly, well-capitalized firms with large exposures to CRE have the least degree of uncertainty about the benefits of AI, as do more tenured professionals who we presume are current senior executives. So generally positive views of the technology. However, it's hardly a near-term priority for most of the respondents to the survey. Despite kind of all the positive views here, it did rank last amongst items that are a top priority within the next 12 months, with just 3% of respondents choosing that. Relatively interesting stuff here. I look forward to digging into those numbers a bit more and breaking them out a few different ways. Again, these are just a few of the topics that we collected data on and that we are going to present in the reports. You'll be able to find the survey landing page link in the show notes where you can see the last quarter's survey results for both the U.S. and Canada. You can also sign up for future survey participation and releases. And then you'll be able to find the most recent results on that same page when they're released in the first week of December. And so hopping over to upcoming events for this week, the earlier this week, based on the the time you're listening to this and when we release the podcast, we're expecting to see consumer confidence data released. And then later in the week, we'll see core PCE data released as well as GDP and personal income and spending data. Any updates that you have on your radar? Yeah. So this week, we've also got some housing and construction data. And so like I've talked about before, we'll have the FHFA 
house price index and the Case Shiller home price index. We'll also have pending home sales later this week. So probably by the time we release the podcast, but also we've got construction spending data at the end of the week. So I'll dig into those numbers. And, and next time we talk, we'll have more on non-residential construction, which I'm, I'm excited to dig into. But we've also got one update. The two of us recorded an interview the other week with Adriana de Alcantara from Heinz, and that will be released next week. So look out for another episode of CRE Exchange. Very excited about that one. I know we both learned a lot from Adriana. But Omar, I think that's all the time we've got today. I look forward to speaking with you on another episode of CRE Exchange in two weeks.